I'm sitting here today with Mr. Marty Wynn, psychologist for how many years? Uh, oh, I don't know, maybe 40 or more. You, you worked in the, uh, the school system and you worked in the prison system. I worked in schools, prisons, community mental health, and now I'm in private practice. What I want to talk to you today is about two things. How do we end? Uh, what is racism? And how a lie can become the truth and it's still a lie. The other one is how do we stop the violence? There was an event uh, a couple of weeks ago, they had a, a, a pool. But to stop the violence, what are some of the things we need to have in place instead of just name calling? Well, when to start with violence, when to start with that question? Yes. Well, violence, I, I think, is created, you know, by helplessness, hopelessness, and despair. You know, when people feel they have no other way out. Sometimes they turn the violence against themselves, so that's depression, suicide, despair. Alcoholism, drug abuse, that's when people deal with that powerful anger by trying to just escape numbing. from it. Numbing. Numbing yourself. So sometimes the violence goes inward and sometimes it goes outward where people destroy things, kill each other. And I think in order to eliminate that violence, you have to give people hope. That means giving them quality education, quality housing, quality health care, job opportunities, having classes for parents on parenting and health care, you know, raising children without anger. When you raise children with anger and abuse, you're going to get angry kids, so that means programs, counseling programs for people. So it's a, it's a very complex problem. So it's education, parenting, housing, health care, and jobs. All these things have to be worked on. You know, I sit here and you talk about education, parenting. In most, some neighborhoods, the kids grow up before they go to school. They heard the cussing, the hollering, the arguing. And they think that is normal behavior. But when they go to school, it's a completely different story. They're in trouble from day one. And they get labeled. Those are some of the things you talked about that need to be changed. Absolutely. I mean, the community and the families have a responsibility, and the schools have a responsibility. We all have to teach nonviolence, from my point of view. You've got to discipline children without anger. You can discipline children kindly and fairly, and use rewards and punishments constructively. And I think, and the kids believe that you care about them, and you love them and you're going to try to keep them safe and they have a better chance. So the violence starts in the, in the homes. If the parents can learn to be non-violent with their children, I think that's going to help. Thank you very much, sir. And the schools, the schools have to have programs for, for, to teach non-violence. Peer counseling programs, individual counseling programs, maybe group groups for kids that are single parent kids or kids that are have parents that are using drugs or alcohol. You, you need program mentoring programs. Teach, teachers mm -hmm. that are sensitive mm -hmm. to the needs of the kids. Teachers that don't use use violence. You know, teachers are yelling and screaming at kids. That's going to cause problems. So it's a it's, it's a it, it, it requires the family, the community, the churches. Everyone has to pitch in and, and help get teach nonviolence and give people tools, other tools. When you're angry, how can you express your anger constructively? 
Okay. I use it in a positive way. Now, looking at you as being a white man. Good reason. <laughs> I told you I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. <laughs> All right. And this is the spot. Okay. You had your last president, Thanks Trump, to come back and say the election okay. is stolen. Right. All right. But there is no proof on that at all. But at the same time, you have the Republicans. You got uh, Miss Cheney right now. They want to take out of office. Looking at it from a psychological piece, what is going on? Can you define it and how do you change it? The perception of it. Well, I would define it as, you know, it's kind of psychological warfare, kind of like what Hitler did. If you, say a, if you say a lie frequently enough and long enough, certain group of people will believe it. He said the Jews were the problem. The Jews created all of the problems in Germany, the economic problems, the social problems. And we needed to take those Jews and put them in concentration camps and then kill them. But the problems of Germany weren't just due to Jews. Maybe there were a few Jews who didn't do things right, but the problems were not the Jewish people. So, so that, this, these lies that certain groups, Jewish people, black people, Muslims, women, uh, gay people, come up with these lies that they're the problem and we need to get rid of them basically. Israel's trying to get rid of Palestinians. Ethnic cleansing. All these things are created by lies. All black people are lazy and dumb and violent. That's, that's, that's the lies that, that, that racists You're prepared, okay. Trump was a racist, and there's a certain base, mostly white men without great education, without great jobs, and they see they're losing those jobs because the coal mines are closing, the factories are becoming automated, and they're being left behind, more and more immigrants are coming into the country, and they, they see all these black people and immigrants as a threat their identity as a man, that they can take care of themselves and earn money because they can't earn what they used to earn and some of them are out of work. When the coal mines close, when the factories close, when jobs get sent overseas because labor is much cheaper, these people become alienated. And so they grab onto someone like Donald Trump, make America great again, bring back all these jobs. He can't bring back all the jobs. He didn't bring back any jobs, very few. So they, they create these lies so that they can remain in power and hold on to hold on to their identity and their sense of worth. That you know, maybe I'm dumb and stupid, but I'm white. <laughs> if we sit here and look at the pandemic. What would you say the new norm would be? The jobs are going. How are people dealing with this? Well, jobs can come back. You know, jobs can will be re, will be created. I mean, once everybody gets vaccinated and we have herd immunity, the economy will get back to some kind of normal. We may have to have shots every year or every six months, but eventually we're going to get a handle on the pandemic. This thing isn't, you know, we have, we have, we have vaccines that work. As long as we can convince everybody to take a vaccine, the economy will start to recover, which is starting to do already. What is so the? I, I think, I think, jo and jobs can be created as we deal with climate change. We have to take the jobs that, for the coal miners and, and fought people in the fossil fuel industries and now give them jobs and help them transition to wind and solar and geothermal 
and other forms of energy so that the climate doesn't keep changing. You know, I think this climate change is a horrible problem because it creates droughts and famines and people in, in, in Africa are trying to get into Europe, drowning off the coast of Europe because they don't let them in there. Some of that has to do with climate change and all, the, and, and all these fires in California. I want to move around the world a little bit. I want people to understand or have acknowledge of what's going on between Israel and the Palestinians. Can you give me a, a brief overview of what's going on over there and in, in that? The Palestinians catching hell just like black folks here. And we don't under, they don't understand that. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I know a little bit about it. Um, uh, in 1948, when the state of Israel was established with the help of Britain and Europe, nobody wanted the Jews. Nobody wanted the Jews from were they had been in the concentration camps. There was a lot of prejudice against Jews, and so a lot of people thought we should have a state, we should have a place for Jewish people. And that's a valid argument that maybe the Jews needed a safe place to be. But it didn't have to be a Jewish state. It should have been a secular state, like the United States. We're not a Protestant state. We're not, we're not a Catholic state. We're, 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 a, we're a country that accepts people of all races and religions. And, and everyone is given, theoretically, full citizenship. So. When the state was established, the, 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 uh, the groups that wanted a, a Jewish state just started, uh, well, they massacred some Palestinians. Sometimes they bought their land, sometimes they stole their land, sometimes they, and they, they, they forced them out. They forced a lot of Palestinians out, so now they're living all over in Jordan and all these adjacent countries because they weren't safe. Just as black people aren't safe here. Palestinians aren't safe. They, they live in segregated areas. They're in the West Bank. They're in Gaza. Gaza is, is a, an outdoor prison. 60% unemployment. Water is undrinkable. They're, they have electricity, I think, half the time or less. So these people are, are, are being oppressed to this day. And the Israeli government, you know, lies and says they're all terrorists and they're all dangerous and, and they shouldn't be given any, any right to vote. They shouldn't be given jobs. You know, they're kept. They, they've got they're these kept walls. They built these walls. <coughs> you know, they, they put in these settlements which are illegal by international law. That's Palestinian land. They and built those Jewish settlements on Palestinian land. They're, say, they're saying there was, no, there, there was no people there before they came. They lied. Yeah, they lied. There were people there. The Palestinians were there. Just like when, when the Europeans came to the United States. There were, there were Native Americans here. There were people here that were disrespected and massacred when this country was founded. You know, I um, went back in history and I did not know where the Chinese, when they came here, they were disrespected. They were treated like slaves. My piece is, we have people of color. We have more in common than we have in differences. There has to be a dialogue to talk about the things that we had in common and what's going on instead of being separate in our communities. How do you start the dialogue? Well, you have to uh, talk to people that are different. You wanna, uh, I'm talking to you. Blacks and white people can get along. We can be brothers. We're, we all want we all want a nice home safe home for our kids, we want education, we want health care, we want respect, we want to be able to use our resources, we all want freedom, we all want the same things, but 
unless we talk to each other and, and work cooperatively, and, you know, stop it's not going to happen. Seeing if, if we see each other, the humanity in each of us and can be logical and rational and negotiate and compromise and problem sell out together, then, then we can get rid of racism. You know, like coming to the table, I think you're familiar with that group. Yes, yes. That's a group where people come together to try to, where, where the ancestors of, of, of slaves and the ancestors of slaveholders come together, blacks and whites, and, and we talk. Right? And we problem solve. And, and we learn about the fact that the blacks built this country. The wealth of the United States was built on the selling cotton and sugar from the backs of right. indentured servants and, 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 and slaves. Uh, the blacks built this country. A lot of the wealth, that's why we're talking about reparations now, to, to pay back, to give back. To what we're doing. And then now some of the cities are starting to do that. And I've done that in my own life. I've, Help some black people. Yeah, me too. You have. Thank you. That, that's reparations. <laughs> and the reason I do that is because I know how black people were kept down for so long. For 400 years they were kept down. So if I can help out a little bit, I'm fortunate. I'm white. I got a lot of money. Not that I haven't suffered in life. I look at we can agree to disagree. I also look at that we can make policy. But you making policy and don't understand culture or changing the culture, what have you done? How do we change that? Because I'm looking at right now, the people in blue, meaning the police, if it was not for the videos, the person who killed George Floyd would be walking. And what did it take for the police to turn on one of their own? Because that is a rag. Well, it's starting, I mean, I mean, the Justice Department, I think uh, the new Attorney General, his name Garland, mm -hmm. the new Attorney General is, is starting to oversee some of the police departments. And then if the policies in the police department change, then the culture <coughs> relationships with the police can, can change. We need we need integrated police. Some of these places it's all white cops in, in, in black areas. That needs to change. Civilian we need civilian with review boards. With subpoena power. With subpoena power, thank you. We need training and selection of police that that understand racism, that understand nonviolence, that understand the need for mental health people. We don't just go into a domestic violence situation and start shooting your gun. You know, you can talk people down. So, so you know, the policies can change, the culture can change. The Black Lives Movement is changing, is changing the the culture, changing policies. You know, more and more black people are running for office. More and more black people are are, are protesting. And, and so eventually, you know, just like the whole, you know, how did we get civil rights laws? How did we get housing laws? How did we get voting laws? I mean, the Republicans are trying to do away with our right to vote and your right to vote. But at least we have, you know, now we have, theoretically, everybody has the right to vote. So I'm saying... Okay. Things can change, is all I'm saying, but it takes organizing and educating and agitating, and, and uh, you just got to keep at it. Now, I sit here and heard you speak on voting rights. Okay. All right? Now, you know, I was up in Atlanta back in January with the uh, Georgia General Assembly. And I'm looking at all the new voting rights restrictions. One, if I see a line of people out there ready, uh, getting ready to vote, if I carry them some you can't water. Can't give them any water, yeah. What the? So if if Trump had won, none of this would be in place. 
they have found no fraud. Now the way it's set up now, and a lot of folks don't understand, is that if somebody come up and say in a county precinct some wrong with some wrong with your vote. They have it set so that they can throw out those votes. And it's not against the law. How do we get our mindsets together and come on equal terms and not end up with a race war? Well, you know, Stacey Abrams has really worked hard in Georgia, you know, to create laws in a situation where people can vote, mm -hmm. do vote, and that's how we won the Senate, because of her work. Right. But Biden now has a Democratic Senate, a Senate because of Stacey Abrams, because she educated people and told black people and poor people and immigrants, you know, you need to vote. You need to register to vote no matter what. You have to wait in line seven hours, you wait in line seven hours to make sure that we get laws and people that stand for social justice and equity and, and make sure that people have the right to vote. And the Republicans create all these dumbass laws that because they have they have no stopping the vote is the only way they can win. They can't win on the issues and the ideas because they don't have any. They don't have real they don't have good ideas for helping people. They want small government. They, they want white people to be in charge. The country's not going to go for that. We're not going to go for that. So they create all these, uh, they try to stay in power, hold on to their money. And they, 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 they come up with all these dumbass laws, but these laws can be challenged. Okay. These laws can be brought up, and some of them are probably unconstitutional. Just because you pass a law, this, that the ACLU right. can, can go to court and, and the law is gone. Because most of them are unconstitutional. Poll taxes. Help me to understand this. The, and I'm talking about the Senate. The president was able to pass the stimulus, get the stimulus passed. All right? But he can't get the John Lewis bill passed. How is that? I'm not familiar with the John Lewis bill. The voter right bill. Voting rights bill. I would think with this, well, the reconciliation rule that helps them get these things, I think it has to do with the budget. It has to be a direct budget. Remember this woman in the in this parliamentarian who said, when you can use reconciliation and when you can't. And okay. She, in one case, she ruled they couldn't use it. And none of them you could. And, and, the and then now she's saying on the on the second bill, the, 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 the big where they get filibuster. The big, yeah, the big infrastructure bill. Now, right. Right. You know that's what a three trillion dollar bill. She's saying that it, because it directly affects the budget that you can bypass the filibuster and just do the, do the fifty percent. So that's why. The Democrats are in good shape right now, and they've got to do something before the midterm election. At least they lose the House and the Senate. They have to act now. So they can talk bipartisanship for a little bit, but then when it comes down to it, they're going to they're gonna bring up, I believe, they're going to bring the, this huge positive bill up, this bill that's going to cut childhood poverty in half and create, a, and create great jobs and, and really get this country moving again, I think that they're going to do it because they have to do it, and now is the only time they can do it. And you I, don't, I don't know, the John Lewis bill, I think it would have to be, maybe you still have to have the 60%, that's why okay. I think it's not going. Um, in your 40 plus years, in your 40 plus years, we are, in terms of psychology. What is it going to take? And you see the division going on now. What is it going to take for us to become whole? It's going to take black people and white people working together. It's going to take changing our immigration laws and let people who are 
running from poverty and, and violence let them into this country. It's going to helping the women and, and people in Afghanistan that that our lives are in danger because we're pulling out military out, giving those people visas. It's going to take massive changes in education, health care, housing, and gun, gun violence. It's, it's going to take all of us working together to create a, a, a positive agenda and having presidents that are halfway sane, like Joe Biden, Joe Biden was my third choice. Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is my first choice. Elizabeth Warren was my second choice. And Joe Biden was my third choice. But he's still 100% better than what we Donald have. Trump. So it means people realizing how important people died to vote and fought to vote. And people need to vote and register and get all their friends to register and get the vaccine. You know, there's a lot of things that can be done, but we have to. You got to. You got to do it every day, and you got to organize and educate people for every election. It's an ongoing, persistent job. Like, like you're staying on top of it. You go here. You go there. You're in Richmond. You're in. You're finding ways to fight back, right? You're educating people. That's what you're doing. You get, you, you, when you increase people's awareness of what they need and what's right and how they can get there, then, then there's a road to progress. What would you like to say in closing? I, I want to say I am pleased to see people like you out there fighting and educating people. I'm pleased to see someone like Joe Biden in office now. And I hope people don't despair. And they educate, organize, agitate. Join the Socialist Party, join the Democratic Party, work with people of different races, and realize that we're all brothers, we're all in the, we're all gonna sink or swim together. If we don't solve climate change and, and, and make sure this vaccine gets to everybody in every country, then we're all gonna no one's safe until we're all safe. And on that note, thank you, Professor Ween. Thanks for asking. Tell me about psychotherapy. I try to give people tools. I try to teach them to argue vigorously against all negative thoughts. I teach them how to do self-hypnosis and meditation so that they can be at peace, so they can think logically, rationally, and positively. I make recordings of, of these meditations and hypnosis sessions so they can listen to them every day and rewire their brain. But I can be positive. I can be very calm with my children. I can express my anger constructively. I can fall asleep quickly. I can, I can grow my support system. So, countering negative thoughts, using meditation, developing your support system, exercising every day, getting enough sleep, eating right. These are the tools I try to encourage people to have and increase their awareness of what they truly need and want and how they can set realistic goals. That's the essence of psychotherapy. Now, Mark. I've noticed in our conversation, you have a monotone, smooth, smooth, real smooth tone. My tone go up and down. Who's to say who's right? Who's to say who's wrong? And if you look at that in terms of perception, I'm the one crazy, you the one smart. If you look at it from the white perspective view, because I raise my voice and they say I'm mad and I'm saying I'm not, but it's up to them to determine on how I feel, but I'm telling you that I'm not. But you are just nice and mellow all the way through. I'm not always nice and mellow. I'm talking to you and there's no risk and no threat here. <laughs> I, you know, I trust you. you know, you're not going to do anything to screw me over. So. But I get angry. I, I I have been angry with my wife at times, and, and I, I get mad. I get very mad when I see Donald Trump on television. I, when I listen to him for four years, I get extremely mad. I feel angry, 
but I don't want to kill anybody. I want to make sure he doesn't get elected the next time. Okay. So I try to use my anger constructively. And, I, and, and just because someone's angry doesn't mean they're crazy. You, know, you have a right to be angry. I'd, be, I'd probably be more angry if I was a black man, you know, if I had suffered what black people have suffered. Not that I haven't suffered. Mm -hmm. My dad had an anger control problem. My mother was overprotective. I, I had some difficulties. I had a lot of counseling. I've increased my awareness. And I, I do meditation every day so I can stay calm. Because I know if I'm calm and positive and logical, then I have a better chance of achieving the things I want to achieve. So I have to work at being at peace. It doesn't mean I don't get angry. John Lewis expressed a lot of anger, but he did it in a constructive way. He said, he said, you know, it's okay to civil disobedience is okay. He said, you know, you can you can break the rules when the rules are wrong. You should break the you should do a sit-in when, when things are wrong. But but he didn't preach violence. Okay. And he said it's okay. I forget what he said about stuff about fighting. Good trouble. Yeah, get into good trouble, right. Good trouble. Good trouble. Well, thanks again. <laughs>